Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Stringy Bark Festival. Such a wonderful event this afternoon we have planned for you. My name is Christy Lawrence and I'll be your host for this afternoon. If you have any questions, please pop them in the chat and we'll be able to get through to those during the presentation. Today, we're joined by Maria Chivarella. Maria, would you like to say a hi to everyone? Hello, everyone, and welcome. Maria is from My Green Garden and she's going to be taking us through this afternoon some delicious tips to make some preserves at home using just your everyday ingredients. So welcome, Maria. Thanks very much, Christy. Thank you. Just let me share my screen, uh, which is this one. And let's jump. Okay. Let's get started, folks. Well, look, I got into preserving well oh, many, many years ago. I suppose it's part of my Italian heritage. Uh, uh, and you know, if you go further back, it's I suppose it's a peasant mentality too. That um, once you've produced lots of food in the garden, or, or being able to get stuff, get your hands on stuff that's uh, seasonally acquired. So you know, tomatoes in summertime, or, or mushrooms in autumn time, and so on. You really want to make them last. So you need to start to learn how to preserve them. And the the processes aren't terribly difficult. I came to them. Uh, of course, with my background, but also with the mindset of a science teacher too. I want to know that when I put things in jars, that they're not going to go off and poison my family. So uh, understanding a little bit of this about the science of what goes on is really important. So there's lots and lots of different ways of preserving. Of course, you probably do it already without realising. As soon as you put something in the freezer, you're preserving it. You're extending its shelf life beyond what you would normally expect. But there's also what we um, traditionally would reserve, uh, um, think as preserves, sauces, relishes and chutneys. Uh, fermenting is a type of preservation technique. There's dehydrating, bottling, pickles, making jams, uh, of course, there's salami, so there's preserved meats as well. But I do tend to concentrate on the fruits and vegetables. A lot of them that come from my own garden or ones that I pick up when they're at their seasonal best, which also means when they're cheapest to do too, so that I can extend those beautiful flavours, usually the summer flavours, well into the year. So when um, I started to look at preserving as well from a scientific background, I was sort of wondering about the different types of jars and things that you can use, but there are even more important things that we need to start with. And the first one is safety. When you're dealing with preserves, more often than not, you're dealing with things that are very, very hot. And in fact, beyond boiling point of water, so beyond 100 degrees Celsius. And so handling hot jars or hot preserves when we're transferring from a saucepan into a jar, you really do need to be careful. Uh, there are lots of tools out on the market nowadays because preserving is, uh, is getting a resurgence in popularity all over again. It's missed a couple of generations, but people are back doing it too. And, you know, at the start of the pandemic, when those uh, supermarket shelves were looking empty, uh, those of us who do preserve still had well-stocked pantries. So, um, so understanding, making sure things, you don't hurt yourself in the process is important. But then there's hygiene. We are well versed in hygiene again nowadays too because of uh, what's been happening. But hygiene is important in terms of um, the jars and sterilising and so on. And I'm going to cover that briefly as well. Now, the bottles and jars to use, and I love this in terms of a sustainability perspective as well. I do collect jars. I, and, and people knowing I collect jars will often give me a lot of jars and I've had to start to say no because literally I, I do have hundreds. But I like to collect jars in all sizes and shapes. So if they're fancy shapes, then they might be ones that I would put a preserve in to give away as a gift. Or if they're smaller ones, if you made a lovely batch of jam, for example, and you've only got huge jars, First of all, number one, if you want to give it away, you're giving away most of your jam all in one hit. But secondly, as soon as you open a jar, you're starting to, um, the, the contents might start to spoil. So smaller jars are really good. But they are jars that quite literally have come from having had ingredients in them beforehand. So the bottles and jars are fine. Uh, lids can be pot problematic though. 
So we do need to put lids back on jars, but you certainly can't reuse lids that have started to show any signs of rust or any signs of wear. So if the paint is starting to strip off from the inside of those lids, um, then it's going to be a problem because rust is going to start to uh, uh, get into your uh, preserves um, foods and we certainly don't want that. So I do tend to find that you can reuse lids once more after you've opened the jar, as long as when you've opened the jar, you haven't distorted the shape of the lid. That is, you haven't gone in there with the tip of a knife or a spoon and prized it open because as soon as you uh, bend that metal, that might mean that that lid might not create a vacuum seal on your jar again. So just if you want to reuse lids from jars of um, pickles or something that you've already had before, just make sure that um, you don't bend the lids. Now I'm going to talk about also how to um, extend the life of your lids as well. But I, I do have to mention these Fowler's Vicola jars. A lot of people come to preserving because they've inherited or someone's cleaned out a garage and they've got box loads of these types of jars. Now, when you get into preserving in Australia here, you'll very quickly start to learn about Fowler's Vicola. Uh, it is the name in Australia for preserving and they create, make lots and lots of different types of implements that help with preserving. And most famous would be their Fowler's Vicola preserving unit, particularly the jars. So those jars, again, are infinitely reusable but the lids and the clips and everything are not. So again, if they start to rust, then you do need to have replaced. So the lids there are equivalent of a screw top lid in that they have a rubber seal, and, but because they're not screw on, they have this clip that helps to keep them in place. Now, if you have these, well and good, by all means use them, but if you don't have them, please, you don't need them. You do not need them. I've preserved for decades now without them. So you can certainly just use supermarket jars of uh, things that have had uh, ingredients in them before. But there are some that we can't use. So jars that have plastic lids are not good for preserving. They do not create a vacuum seal. And a vacuum seal is, um, is created when hot ingredients go into a jar and you put the lid on the top Later on when you go to open, you'll find it's very difficult to open because a vacuum seal has been created. Um, you can't do that with a plastic lid. So I might keep jars like the one on the left, that plastic lid, I might keep that, but I need to put dried herbs or something in. Nothing that I need to create a vacuum seal with. So don't use those for putting your preserves in. Your stuff will probably go mouldy in those. But certainly the ones with the metal lids, as long as the metal lids haven't started to corrode at all, and that's fine. Now, where can you get replacement lids from? Well, if you're uh, living in Knox area, then you're very lucky because there is a place in Knox called COSPAC, C-O-S-P-A-K, uh, COSPAC, and they're not far from Knox Shopping Centre. Now, I don't know if you're allowed to actually go and buy anything right now until retail opens up, but they do sell lids in lots of different sizes, lots and lots of different sizes. You may need to buy a, a bulk pack and that might be you know, 20 or 30 lids, but you ask them and, and see what you can do. But that's a good way of getting lots of replacement lids. But there are, uh, there are other substitutes as well. And here is something else put out by Fowler's Vicola. And it is quite simply a square of food grade cellophane that can be placed on top of jars once you've got your pickle or your chutney or your relish or your jam or your sauce in there, you can put this cellophane over the top. It comes with elastic band as well, while the contents are still hot. And then you'll find that the cellophane uh, becomes quite taut or tight over the top. So if you've got a lid that's a little bit dodgy, let's say, you don't want it to come in contact with the sauce or chutney that you've made, put the cellophane over the top and then you can just sit the lid over the top. It's not coming into contact with your preserve. These you can find at supermarkets. So in your baking aisle, look very closely, you'll find them in there. Um, $1.50 for a pack of 24, so they're not gonna break the budget, 
good idea to have them on hand. They last forever. Uh, they're single use, of course, but they last for a long time. Um, just to have them handy, just in case you've gone to make a preserve and you think, oh no, I really shouldn't be using this particular lid on a jar. Okay, so hygiene, remember, also talks about, besides washing your hands really well, sterilising your jars and bottles. This is important, particularly if we're just putting our finished preserve, be it sauce, chutney, relish, uh, pickle jam, you're putting it in there and you don't need to do anything else. You're just putting it in and putting the lid on. You've got to make sure that we've cleaned out the jar completely of any bacteria that might be lurking in there. So different methods you might be familiar with or you may not. And so you might find it a little bit good, uh, good to use. One is called boiling water. And that's simply putting, um, getting a large saucepan and submerging the jars that you want to uh, clean into cold water and then bringing it up to the boil and perhaps letting it boil for 10, 15 minutes and then taking them out. So remember what I said about we're touching a lot of hot, hot um, implements here. So trying to get these jars out of hot water, you've got to be really careful. So boiling water, look, I don't mind it as a method, but I certainly don't use it. Also because I find too, if I've got um, jars that have got sticky labels on them and you put them in boiling water, those sticky labels tend to get lodged off and you think, yeah, you're great, I've got rid of that label. But on the other hand, a lot of glue from that label is now swirling around in that water. And so it's not going to be as hygienic as what you might have thought. So I don't tend to use it, but it is a common one. I do prefer to use the oven. So a slow oven, that means like about 120 degrees Celsius, because bacteria, um, won't survive beyond 75 degrees Celsius. So you're getting it at good enough temperature. So make sure your jars are clean, sit them on a tray in the oven, and then uh, while you're making your preserve, and then take them out ready to put your hot preserves into those hot jars. So 120 degrees for 15, 20 minutes is ample. Uh, but you can use the microwave to great effect as well. So one way of using the microwave, uh, I know if people have told me they just put jars straight in the microwave with nothing in them and then microwave them for a bit. What I prefer to do is to get uh, my jar, put in say two centimetres of water in that jar and then turn it on for as long as I can see that water boiling in that jar for 30 seconds. So that effectively steams your jars and the steam will kill off any bacteria. Much safer to use though, again in the microwave, is a sterilising, a baby bottle sterilising unit. Get your hands on one of these. Uh, op shops often have them, once op shops are allowed to open again. Uh, mine fits six or seven jars in it. So you put them in upside down, 200 mils of water, four minutes, and they're sterile. What I like about this is I'm making a lot of preserves over summer. So to have the oven on, not only does it take a lot more energy, but it also heats up the kitchen. So I do prefer using my little microwave baby bottle sterilizing unit. There's also sterilizing tablets that you can buy. You'll find these in the baby bottle aisle, the baby food aisle of the supermarket. And these were traditionally used to sterilize baby bottles. Uh, it's just a tablet put into some cold water. Your bottles have to sit in there for 15 minutes, uh, but they, the water actually will continue to sterilise for 24 hours. So you can be continually adding and taking things out of there. As long as your fingers don't go in it and you're pulling things out with tongs instead. Uh, this is really important if you're making things like cheese. Not part of our uh, thing today, but we, we can imagine with cheeses, there's milk, there's a lot more bacteria. And so keeping everything sterile as possible is really important. And lastly, a hot dishwasher. If you've got a dishwasher that can go beyond that 75 degrees, run your jars through that and use them, take them out and let them um, sort of air dry, but use them while they're still hot. So, but remember that critical temperature to kill off bacteria is 75 degrees Celsius. So your dishwasher needs to go beyond that temperature. So this is really important. Find out which method suits you best um, and, then, uh, and then use it to, uh, to uh, put your preserves in jars that are, you know are nice and clean to start with. That's the jars and the bottles, but the lids are a little bit different. Here that's quite simply put them into a saucepan with water, 
bring into the boil, let them boil for several minutes, and then very carefully take them out and drain them on a clean tea towel, ready to use so that when your, your jam is in your jar, you can just put your lid straight on there. Just make sure, again, you don't touch the underside of that with your fingers, because you might be transferring bacteria all over again. Uh, those preserving tools I mentioned before, I've got one that's just looks just like a pen, but it's got a magnet on the end. And so I can put that into the water, that magnet picks up those lids nice and easily. And so I never get burnt doing anything like that. So that's how to sterilize and so on. Do we have any questions at this point? I'm gonna stop after each section and take questions uh, on what we might've seen before. Have we got anything yet, Christy? Asking, how would you tell if your dishwasher gets to those temperatures over the 75 degrees? Look, usually your dishwasher will have a setting that you can see. Uh, mine's sort of digital and it'll show me, I don't get, mine doesn't get to that temperature. But sometimes they've got a pot setting or an intensive setting and that will usually be beyond that 75. Great, thank you. And another person's asking, can you sterilise by spraying with alcohol? Uh, uh, will that kill that bacteria? Look, I wouldn't risk it. Alcohol is a preservative, uh, but I, no, I, I probably wouldn't. Nor with hand sanitizer either, just in case you've got too much of that too. No, stick to one of those other methods. Excellent. And just last question before we go on to the next topic is, with those clear view wraps, yep. how are they different to using just standard Gladrack or Klimgrap? Uh, there's cellophane, first of all, so it's not Gladrack. Uh, so that's different in that respect. And cellophane actually comes from um, cellulose, which is a tree-based fibre as well. But it's got to be food grade, which means that eventually it does degrade. So you could even put your compost bin, it does degrade. So it's different from the cellophane that you might get around, um, you know, bunches of flowers. That's not food grade stuff, it's more plastic. Uh, so look, it, it is different. You won't get the same uh, air tightness with gland wrap, for example, as you would with the cellophane. Great, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so let's look at some preserving methods that I'm going to look at today. We'll see how we go for time. I'm starting off with sauces, chutneys and relishes simply because they are the easiest ones. And you can make up a big pot of this stuff, put it into a whole lot of little jars. You can see there I've decorated some jars in order to give away for, as Christmas gifts. So we're getting towards that time of the year where you might start to think of these things. And if you still have time, still got time on your hands, you know, you might as well make them now because they will last until Christmas and well beyond. In fact, you can usually uh, at least a year shelf life, if not two. So let's have a look at how they're made. Basically, whichever recipe, sorry, whichever ingredient you're focused on. So for example, you might have a lot of tomatoes in the garden then you find a tomato for a chutney, a tomato chutney or a tomato relish. By the way, the differences between these, um, a sauce of course is smooth. Uh, it's cooked for a long time, but then you need to puree it somehow, bar mix for example. A chutney is a lot chunkier. Uh, it's still cooked for a long time, so the flavors of them are quite mellow. A relish has a bit more bite to it because they're not cooked for as long. And I'll show you some recipes here. But basically it is just finding a recipe and then putting in sterilized jars, sealing it all up when it's nice and hot, and then, you know, it's ready. So here's a quick look at a recipe, a, a tomato relish, or someone's family tomato relish. What you're gonna find, the similarities between all of these is the preserving ingredient. What ingredients are in there that are actually doing the preserving? Have a look, sugar and vinegar. And in any of these recipes, you're gonna find sugar and vinegar. They are the preserving uh, things. They'll also, of course, impart flavor. So whether you use white sugar or brown sugar, that's gonna change the flavor a little bit. Uh, whether you use you know, apple cider vinegar, white vinegar, balsamic vinegar, it's going to change the flavour a bit. But they are necessary in order to do the preserving. Now, I know people are going to ask me, can we, can we um, you know, downgrade, downplay the amount of sugar, for example, because sugar is a big no-no in our diet. And I, I look, my response to that is you're going to compromise the preserving ability. So instead of being able to keep this in the pantry unopened, you might have to keep it in the fridge and it certainly won't have as long a shelf life. 
Um, so th there's that issue there too. So just looking at that one now, let's look at another one. This I call my best ever tomato ketchup recipe and I've got a colleague at work who absolutely loves this. Uh, if you knew how easy it was to make, have a look at the preserving ingredients again. It's white vinegar and sugar. They're the preserving agents. The rest are just ingredients. The main ingredients in this recipe, tomatoes, there's Granny Smith apples. You'll often find apples in these sorts of things because they do tend to be a bulk filler in your chutneys and your sauces and so on. And then there's onions and then there's garlic and then a bit of ginger and then later on for taste, a bit of pepper, some cayenne, cloves and so on. This recipe, by the way, is on my website to have a look. Now it's important that the tomatoes that we're using are not uh, salad tomatoes, they're more the cooking tomatoes, otherwise your sauce will be very watery and it means you've got to cook it down for a lot longer to get rid of that water. Uh, so they're the preserving agents again. There's another one here, a sweet tomato and eggplant chutney. Have a look at those preserving agents all over again, sugar and white vinegar. You'll always find them in these sorts of things. So. The hardest part in making a chutney sauce or relish is all the chopping up. So for example, in this one here, it's two kilos of tomatoes that we need to peel and then chop up. Then there's onions, half a kilo, need to chop them up. Then the eggplants need to chop them up. And then garlic, chop them. Can you see why when people did preserving, it was done as a family thing or, you know, mum would get her daughters over and for, you know, from different households or whatever and stand there and they'd be chatting away while they're chopping. It, it is a lovely community thing to do uh, with groups of friends when we're allowed to have them over for these sorts of occasions. And growing up in an Italian household, this was very much so. We didn't make chutneys and so on, but we certainly made our tomato passata every year. And we still do with different groups of people that come over. And it's a great day. All the hard work is there, you know, all the chopping and so on, but it's made a lot more pleasurable by being around people. So it's a lovely sense of community as well. So that's what we need to worry about with these things. It's very, they're very easy, the hard parts in the chopping, and we just tend to put them all into a saucepan, large saucepan, bring it to the boil, stir it so everything's dissolved, and then just let it cook away until it's thick and pulpy. And in this case, for example, it simmers for 50 to 60 minutes and then we put it into our, um, our sterilised jars, which are nice and hot. Put the lid on and that's it. Your preserves are made. Okay, I'll take questions on those ones first. Christy? Great, we have a few ingredient questions there. So in terms of the sugar, a few things there. If you're trying to reduce your sugar, and also could you replace the sugar with something such as honey or jaggery? Um, look, in the end, Look, you could, but in the end, it is still sugar. So once upon a time, say a century ago, where white sugar was not as uh, easily obtained, people used to use honey. And of course, you're going to get a different flavour. Now, jaggery is that Indian sort of sugar type thing, I think. I've never tried it. Yes, I mean, honey is a fantastic preserving agent, but let's boil it down, as in, look at the facts. It still is a sugar source. So it still has that same effect in your body. What I like to say to people, if they're trying to reduce how much sugar goes into your, your preserves, just try and reduce how much you use every time you serve it up. So for example, if you're looking at jams, there's an awful lot of sugar in jam, you know, and, but I've had breakfast with people where they pile on that jam so it's a centimetre or two thick, whereas I will use it, but it's just a smear of the jam. And so for me, it's not that much of a problem. So just look at how much you're consuming rather than how much is in the preserve itself. I know that's a really trite answer, but in terms of the actual preserving, um, yes, you can use the jagger, you can use the honey. It will change the flavour, but it still is sugar. Great, thank you. And another ingredient question there. What does the onion and the garlic do? Does it help to preserve or if I'm allergic to it, will it have an impact if I yeah. leave it? No, it's a fructose issue as well. No, it's not a preserving. It's just flavour. It's just flavour. So, yes, you can remove it. Yeah, you, um, you, it's going to sort of upset the balance of the ingredients a little bit, but, yeah, of course, you can remove it, yeah. 
Great, we'll just do one more question on the ingredients before we go on to the filling questions later. As Could you please explain a bit more what you meant by those cooking tomatoes versus salad tomatoes? Okay, yeah, big difference there. Um, so when, I, when people talk about growing tomatoes, I always, and they ask what varieties, I say, well, what are you going to use it for? Salad tomatoes will just have, be a lot more watery than a cooking tomato. So cooking tomato is more like a plum shape or a Roma tomato. So there's a lot more meat, a lot less seed. That's the difference. So when you're cooking those ones down, you're not going to get as much water being formed from it as compared to a salad style tomato. So if you're growing them in your garden and, and that's all you've got, by all means use them, but they won't, um, you just need to cook them longer to cook off that excess water. If you're going to buy them to make preserves, this time of year is not a good time to make tomato preserves from bought tomatoes because you can't get Roma tomatoes uh, easily. In February, March, you can buy them by the caseload and that's what we do uh, for making our tomato preserves. So this time of the year, you're probably looking at different styles of preserves if you wanted to make them now. Excellent. I'll hold off on the filling and the packaging questions to after our next topics. Thanks. Sure. Okay. So I think we'll just have time to look at pickles uh, now. So pickles are the next step, stage in difficulty of preserves because there's an extra step that wasn't in the chutneys and sauces and relishes. So pickling now involves... The first step is after you've chopped up your ingredients is salting the ingredients. And sometimes they are dry salted, which just means you're sprinkling salt over the ingredients. So up the top there, there's cauliflower, looks like green tomatoes and onions. After salt has been sprinkled over them, after several hours, you get all this moisture uh, forming at the base. And that's just moisture that's come out of your, your ingredients. That moisture is then removed and then your, um, your ingredients are covered in some sort of um, flavoured vinegar solution. Now, let's just, just go back to this slide before I showed you pictures here. This top one here, uh, that looks like at my bread and butter pickle, it's got some capsicum in it. So these are pickles that are sitting in um, vinegar solution. Down here, this is the green tomato mustard pickle. So this is something that you spread. So the brine, the, um, sorry, the vinegar solution is mixed in uh, and, and thickened up with a bit of corn flour in there. Whereas this pickle here is a green tomato pickle uh, that has no, um, uh, it, it's sitting in oil, in fact. So this is an Italian style preserve. So it's not sitting in vinegar. There was vinegar involved but it's sitting under oil. So these are really good for an antipasto type platter. So just a little bit different uh, in, in difference in all the pickles. Now these top two are made with, uh, there is sugar in the thing, whereas the Italian style doesn't have any sugar, if you're worried about that. So let's keep going. I wanna show you how to uh, make the zucchini pickles. I've got a little video to show you here. So again, let's have a look at what the preserving ingredients are here again. And there they are, the vinegar and sugar. The rest are just the ingredients and other stuff for flavouring, vinegar and sugar. So the first step is, um, is salting. So I've got a little video here. Let's watch this. So I'm making these zucchini, very simple ingredients here. So you've got a slice of the zucchini. If you've got a mandolin, it makes it much, much easier. Put those zucchini in a large bowl. Now, if you can't have the onions, you can skip the onions, but otherwise onions go in there and sprinkle generously with salt. Here it's a wet brine, so we're covering it with water as well. Leave it for an hour. Now get your pickling ingredients ready, which is vinegar, the sugar, and these are some aromatics. So turmeric, mustard, a little bit more salt, and there was one last one, mustard. And then you drain the salty stuff, get your pickling liquid ready, which means boiling it until the sugar is dissolved. And then once it's boiled, then you add your drained vegetables, turn up the heat until it boils again. Once it boils, then you turn it off and it's a matter of putting it into your sterilised jars. Uh, once they're in there, then we top it up with the pickling liquid and now we have to put the lids on. Now that lid's a bit dodgy, so I'm showing you here how to use one of those cellophane wraps. So I've wet the cellophane wrap just with water, 
and the wet side goes away from the food itself. Then I fasten it with the elastic band and that's it. That will dry up and become quite taut. And then I can sit a, a jar lid over the top because it's not going to come into contact. Always label your, um, your preserves, not just with uh, what's in them, but the date that you made them. So if you've made lots and lots, then obviously use the older ones first. And this recipe and the video again is, um, is on my website too. Okay, so we've got time for questions now and then we'll see if we've got a quick minute at the end, I can quickly talk about jams as well. Great, we've had some really Second. interesting questions. Thank you so much, Maria, and our audience. So in terms of, I'll just circle back to those packaging ones before. There was a picture up of the click top lids with the rubber rings. Are they suitable for that? They're, yeah, they are. They're the, they're the um, uh, yes, they, sorry, those ones that the flip lids. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, they're fine for preserving. Rubber uh, seals on the inside, though, may need to be replaced. So look out for those. Often kitchenware places will have them tucked away somewhere uh, because they, they will last for one or two preserves and they, the rubber gets all, a little bit dodgy. So yes, they can be used. Definitely. And most of the lids you showed were metal. Can you also use a glass lid? <laughs> uh, so are you thinking things like old coffee jars? Uh, yeah, you can, you can. Um, I do tend to find though, that if I've got hot preserves in one of those Makona style coffee jars, the lid sort of pops off. So what I do is I get some sticky tape and tape it right across over the top. So it helps to keep it in place while, while the contents cool down. Great, thank you. And with the ingredients, we have a couple more questions there. Are there any alternatives to using the vinegar? Uh, in terms of pickle? Um, no, not really, because pickle is by its nature something made with vinegar. Okay, so that's the, that's the definition of pickle. In terms of the chutneys and relishes and so on, again, um, vinegar is one of the integral things for it. But there are other preserves that don't use um, vinegars and so on. So you sort of got to keep an eye out for those. Um, but they will tend to be very sweet preserves instead. But if you want to do fermenting, if it's vinegar you're having um, issues with, fermenting vegetables, for example, there's no vinegar in sight, but the fermentation process creates lactic acid which is the acidic component. The acid helps to keep bacteria at bay and that's why it's important. So in fermentation, um, the fermentation process creates the acid in, a, in and of itself. So that's probably why it's a little bit gentler on people's stomachs than vinegar if that's an issue for you. Now, fermenting is another topic for another day. It's quite a huge one. Sure, no problem. Someone has just asked a follow-up question to that. Could you use lemon juice? or a lemon liqueur instead of the vinegar then? Oh, not a lemon liqueur, no. Um, a lemon juice, which is a an awful lot of lemon juice though. Um, I can't say I ever have. Uh, is, it as, is it as acidic as vinegar? That's what you're aiming for. You would probably need to do a bit of research on, and, and some lemons aren't as acidic. For example, Maya lemons aren't as acidic as your standard Eureka or Lisbon lemons. Um, look, you possibly could. Your flavour is going to be very, very different though. You know, it might be worth experimenting with a small batch. I wouldn't be doing kilos and kilos of vegetables. Just do a small batch and see how it works out. See if you like the flavour. That reminds me though, if you ever make something that has the acidic component, that vinegar and sugar, you really should leave for a month before you eat it. By that stage, those sharp flavours of the vinegar and the really sweet flavour of the sugar will have mellowed each other out, will have balanced each other out. So you'll get a much more, um, a more mature taste uh, than something that's eating fresh. So that's just something, you know, open it after a month to try it. Sometimes that's hard to wait, but it's worth doing. Great. And earlier you mentioned tomatoes. Could you use passata instead of the tomatoes? Now uh, you could use tinned tomatoes rather than passata. So you could use, you know, whole tinned tomatoes instead. You could try that certainly for your, um, for your ketchup or your tomato sauce things. Yeah, why not? 
Sure. And last question on ingredients before we move on to the process. Are you able to substitute the sugar with salt instead to preserve? Uh, in the pickle, uh, in the Italian style pickles, yes, we don't use any uh, sugar. So that, those green tomatoes, this process, the green tomatoes, you can do it with zucchini, you can do it with eggplant, you can do it with green capsicum, not red, but green. Um, you layer, you, you thinly slice your vegetables, layer them with a, a layer of salt in between, and then you leave it overnight. The next day you drain off that liquid that has formed and give them a quick rinse. And this time overnight, you, you give them a sprinkle of vinegar and leave them overnight. And then the next day you sort of squeeze the excess vinegar out of it and you layer them in jars with your olive oil in between them. So that, yeah, so it's a little bit different. There's no sugar involved in that one. You've got a different pickle, but it's, it's really nice still. And details and step-by-step -step again is on my website. Excellent. And when you pickled the vegetables, did you cook them beforehand or did they go in raw? Um, they cook briefly in the, um, in the pickling solution, but only briefly. So you put them in there, you wait for the solution to come back up to the boil, and then that's enough cooking. You don't want to soften them too much. You want your pickles to have a little bit of, uh, we call it bite or text, enough texture so they're not soft and mushy as such. Lovely. Now moving on to the actual process, when you're filling up the jars, how far do you fill them? Do you do it to the top or do you leave a small little gap there? Thank you very much for asking that question. I forgot to mention it. We leave what's called a one centimetre head space. So you do not fill right to the top. You fill it to within one centimetre of the top and then you put the lid on. Now what happens, that helps to create the vacuum seal because above in that little air gap will be a lot of um, condensation or moisture that create, is created as it cools down. And so uh, that, that air that was in there has now condensed back into your pickle, whatever it is. And so there's an air, there's there's a vacuum in there. There's no air in that little seal set in that little headspace. So that's why what makes the lid so hard to open is because it's now vacuum sealed. So yes, it is important to leave that one centimetre gap. Great. And that one centimetre gap goes across all of the pickles, the chutneys, the relishes. Yep. 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 It does. It does. Anything hot that goes into a jar has to have that headspace. Great. And once you have filled the jars, do you need to then also reboil those jars in a water bath? Okay, you don't need to if the preserving ingredients are in the recipe itself. So if it has that sugar, has that vinegar, you don't need to reboil. Um, that's a different technique, more used for, say, preserving fruit. Uh, it's called bottling. However, if you wanted to reboil the jars with the contents and their lids already in them, that will extend the shelf life from two years up to you know, three or four years, for example. That really creates that extra vacuum seal and it really, that heating heats up the whole contents to make sure that if there is any bacteria at all, that it's completely dead at that point. I don't tend to boil um, things that have the preserving ingredients in them, that is the sugar and the, the vinegar. But I do if I'm using uh, recipes and I'm cutting down the amount of sugar. I haven't got rid of it completely, but I'm cutting down the amount and then I just do boil them to make sure that that vacuum is there just to ensure that um, preserving will um, will be uh, good for that for that time, whatever it might be. Excellent. You mentioned that the shelf life is around two years. Are you able to give us a bit of a range for the different types of preserves, how long that they will last? Look, ones with sugar in them um, will last. Look, I, I, I'm loath to say beyond two years. Or I, I usually say one to two years because it also depends on how you store those jars. So if you store them in direct sunlight, they're not going to last as long. So the best storage is in a cool, dry, dark place. Cool, dry, dark. So we're not getting uh, variations in temperature fluctuating so much. Uh, that'll help to preserve them. Uh, it's dry, there's not too much moisture around that might get into the jar or corrode the lid. So really your preserving um, time frame really does depend on how well you store them. So while it might be lovely to, to display these beautiful, colourful jars 
you know, on the kitchen bench. So all your visitors, when we're allowed to have the visitors, they can see them. It's not a good idea in terms of the shelf life of the preserve itself. Great. And once you actually open the preserves and start consuming that delicious food, how do you then protect it and make sure it's preserved for longer? <laughs> yeah, look, I do tend to keep them in the fridge after that. I know it could be overkill. My mum never did. <laughs> we still alive to, to tell the tale. But once they're open, uh, I do put them in the fridge. Um, definitely things that don't have enough sugar or vinegar it definitely needs to go in the fridge to start with. But yeah, once they're open, I do tend to store them in the fridge. Excellent. And we just have one last question come through back on those ingredients before. Are you able to explain a little bit more about that relationship between the vinegar and sugar? And how does it work together? Um, okay. Well, what sugar does, sugar is actually a dehydrating agent, believe it or not. So sugar draws out moisture from the ingredients that you've got in there and that evaporates off as part of the, um, as part of the cooking process, okay? Now, what you've got to understand, this is from a scientific point of view, bacteria need moisture in order to, to, um, to survive. Sugar helps to break down the cell walls of the bacteria and so on, and also dehydrates your food to an extent so it becomes thicker. So that's why sugar is used as a preserving ingredient. The vinegar, on the other hand, creates a pH or an acidity level that bacteria can't thrive at. So we need, we need that acidity in order to stop bacteria um, reproducing itself. So that's the reason for it. Now, one is very tart, the other one is very sweet. In and of themselves, it makes your, your, um, your, your preserved taste either very tart or very sweet. That's why I like to allow a month for those flavours to mellow each other out so that you've got a lovely tasting balanced preserve at the end of that month. Beautiful. And in our last two minutes, are you able to just share a little bit about how these techniques differ for when you actually make some jams or marmalades? <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, jams and marmalades, if I can talk very quickly, <laughs> um, uh, in, all this information is on my website as well, including how to make jams. Um, there's no vinegar involved in jams. It's just the fruit. The fruit contains this substance called pectin. Uh, pectin helps the setting of the jam. Uh, sugar that goes with that as well, and then some acidity. And the acidity in this case would be lemon juice. Combine all of those together with heat, and that heat's got to get to about 105 degrees Celsius, and it becomes less of a puree and more of a jam at that point. Um, and that's, that's it in a nutshell, but there are some lots of tips and techniques uh, on how to make sure it tastes really nice as well. well thank you very much, Maria. And it with your company, My Green Garden, do you run workshops and classes on these different topics as well? Um, I used to until I started working at Whitefriars College. Hello, Sandra, if you're there. Uh, uh, throughout the day, yes, I used to run workshops from home, quite a few of them. Uh, I don't anymore, and I used to run them for councils. Uh, we were meant to have one this year for Knox earlier in the year, but that, of course, was, um, was scuppered by COVID. So Look, eventually we will again, um, just not in the foreseeable future, unfortunately. Excellent. And do you have any last, one last tip for us before we end the session on the main thing we should remember when we preserve? Um, just look out for what's seasonal. Get it at its seasonal best, all right? So if strawberries on special, I mean, you know, a good special, buy them up, freeze them for when you're ready to make some strawberry jam. So I'm always on the lookout or what I can make. So get some recipes that you try them, that you really like and, and just, um, you know, have them handy and get together with a bunch of friends and make a day of it when we're allowed to. Excellent. Well, that's about all we have time for, but as Maria had on her screen, you can contact her at her website and I'm sure she'll be able to answer any further questions. So just Lovely. like... Thank you very much, Marie. That was a really informative session. And to our audience for the wonderful questions that came through. Okay. of Art Festival is on until 9pm tonight. So please check out the other exciting things that we have on our program. There are lots of presentations, performances, 
and some wonderful acts throughout the evening. I, after this session closes, there'll be a very short, just a little one minute survey that pops up on your screen. And we'd really appreciate your feedback. Thank you again, Maria, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Bye for now. Thank you.